The snakes grew from my scalp like thick carnivorous vines rising from the rich pulpy soil of the marrow of my skull. I became a serpent-headed calamity. And Neptune rules the deep. He did Uh, welcome to Speculative Boston, uh, which was founded by Andrea Martinez Corbin, who is in the audience. Uh, we are re reading series for the vibrant science fiction, fantasy, and horror community within the Boston area, and I am so glad you could come tonight. Um, so I'm Jillian Daniels. I'll be your host. I'm a local author from Somerville with short stories and poems in the Dark Magazine, Strange Horizons, Beneath Ceaseless Skies other places. Uh, I'd like to thank Trident Booksellers for hosting us and the Science Fiction and Fantasy Writers of America, or CIFWA, for supporting this series. So tonight we have three authors reading, C.S.E. Cooney, Nina McLaughlin, uh, and Sonia Tafe. Uh, I'll let them introduce themselves, read their words, and then afterward we'll have a nice little chat and I'll open it up to questions. All right, get ready for fun. <laughs> Hi there, I'm Claire. Um, I write under the name C.S.E. Cooney. My book, Desdemona and the Deep, came out with Tor.com last July, and it is available here for purchase. It has goblins in it, and uh, champagne, and unions, but I'm not reading from that tonight. I am reading something called the Twice Drowned Saint, being a tale of fabulous Galethel, the invisible wonders who rule there, and the apostates who try to escape its walls. And I just finished it this morning at 3 a.m. ish. It's, one of, it's in a series of what I like to call my accidental novels, wherein I'm not meaning to write one, but I, I was trying to be so very good and write a novella for my friend who asked for one. I'm sorry. Sorry you get a short novel. I hope that's okay. Um, so I'm going to read just two short sections, one from the beginning, one from the middle. One, Analepsis, Portrait of a Child Saint. There were two things every Gelfic citizen knew. One, only saints could see the angels who ruled us. Two, Alizar the Eleven-Eyed, seventh angel of Galethel, had no saint. He hadn't had one for a long time. Now, I will tell you what the angel Alizar looks like. I can do that because I was the saint no one else in Galethel knew about. I was the seventh angel's best kept secret, and he was mine. The angel Alizar sometimes looked like a human-shaped paper lantern, or a sudden release of soap bubbles, or a cloud. He glowed on the inside as if he'd swallowed a hive of horny fireflies, and on the outside, he looked as if a toddler with a glue gun had gone wild with the craft buckets containing outrageous feathers and twining golden vines and trumpet-like flowers and thin prismatic insect wings. <laughs> Alizar also had the ability to spontaneously produce eyeballs whenever and wherever he fancied, though I'd never seen him sport more than 11 at a time, hence his name. <laughs> when he was in his human-slash-lantern shape, Two of his eyes were pretty much where you'd expect them, affixed to the center of his head, only his eyes were elongated ovals, perfectly symmetrical of a deep, unending twilight blue. No pupils or sclera or anything, Alizar the Eleven-Eyed couldn't be bothered with minutia. Higher up on the center of his forehead he had one all-black eye, glossy as a wolf spider's. Another eyeball resided where his nose should have been, yellow, and slit across the center like a goat's. Three smaller eyes, robber fly green, beaded the lower part of his mouth, face like a mouth. He had no mouth, otherwise. A torque of three round red eyeballs opened like cavican carnelians right above his collarbones, if he had collarbones, which he didn't. One great golden eye blinked sleepily from the curve of his breast, bright amidst a nest of pale down. He loved to be admired. He was very vain and always preening, but good-naturedly, willing to see beauty in everyone else around him, too. His problem was, of course, that only a handful of saints could see him, and they were all wrapped up in their own angels. I was supposed to be the one who devoted my whole attention to him, only I'd refused his offer when I was seven years old, and that was three decades ago. As my saint, you could have everything you ever wanted. 
he'd sang to me that day, in that way angels have of singing, which is a little like having your head held under water and your feet set on fire while being tickled, and also a little bit like being licked by a giant oyster tongue only on the inside of your body. I shook my head. Gross, I'd said, very softly, so no one else in the celestial corridor could hear me. Alizar pulled back a bit on his singing, and the overwhelming urge to pee and giggle and vomit left me. He said coaxingly, if you confess your vision of me to the heraldic voice, they will know you have tested true. We can have you gowned, crowned, and cloistered before lunchtime. You shall live your life and mewed with 13 others of your kind, one saint per angel appointed till death does us part. You'll be given every luxury, a closet stuffed full of fabulous clothes, all the jewels of the treasury, the finest foods, a host of servants, the best education, and unlimited access to the hate geological archives of Galethel. All you'd have to do in return is never leave the walls of the celestial centipede, ever. No thanks, I muttered under my breath. I'm going to grow up and be like my bad uncles, or maybe like one of the zilch, and ride around the desert on a viper bike, or maybe like I'll run away and be a movie star or something. Oh, you like movies, do you? Alizar seemed very interested, which made me more interested. Oh, sure, I said. And then we got to talking for a while about our favorite films, and the whole conversation ended quite amiably, with both of us agreeing to look the other way and pretend that this whole thing had never happened. Only it had, irrevocably. Mind you, Ish, you're still my saint, whether anybody knows about it or not, Alizar warned me. That's not something I have any control over, it just happens. Just don't tell anyone. I don't want to be stuffed in a cell to pray all the time. I won't tell if you won't. Alazar batted all eleven of his eyes at me, even going so far as to grow extra eyelashes for greater effect. And anyway, he mused with typical angelic obliqueness, it might be better, after all, if no one knows about you. For now. And I'm just going to skip ahead to chapter 12. <laughs> it's called the Serac. On our, on, <clears throat> on our maps, Galethel was the center of the world, a white diamond enclosed by a blue diamond labeled the Gelfic Serac. This was the wall enclosing the angelic city on all sides, 200 meters high at the jagged tips of its peak, 50 meters thick at the base, all of it pure compressed ice. From its foundation, Galethel, rhombic in shape, was 15 kilometers long on each of its side, with a total area of 225 square kilometers. Most citizens assumed it was the shape that earned Galethel its nickname, the Diamond of Belisar. But the saints, who studied such things, all knew that the origins went back much further than that. In ancient times, what later became our city was an inland lake fed by the Anasat River. Lake Amula was its name, sometimes called for its glimmering, the Diamond of Belisar. Angelic revelations came piecemeal to the saints, but over the centuries, a picture of Galethel's prehistory began to emerge. The saints recorded their findings slowly and painstakingly in the hagiological archives, but only a privileged few of the laity were ever permitted to study there, and so the story was not well known. I knew it, of course, because Alizar the Elevenite had told me. Lake Amula had once been a shining, shallow, saltwater plain, only brine shrimp and brine flies lived there. Most living things found the waters undrinkable, and for this reason, humans never lingered long in its vicinity. And because gods did not go where their worshippers could not, it was a godless lake, content to be so. But millennia of quiet contentment was shattered when one day, from out of the burning depths of Belisar, a god did indeed flee to Lake Amula, pursued by an army of demons. With her 15 angelic companions, she ran. From who knew what war ravaged realm beyond Belisar? From what army of conquerors or converters who upended her reign? From which sorcerer priests of stronger gods who had unleashed the demon horrors seeking to devour her? Harried through the wastes, the god bolted at all speed until she came to the edge of that deathly glittering basin, Lake Amula. And springing from the salt rock shores, the god dove into the very heart of the shallows. She made such a splash that the lake waters flew up in all directions like a startled flock of birds, like a rainstorm in reverse. Then from the epicenter of her own quake, the god reached out in all directions and wrenched the waters rising all around her, billions of tons of brine, a vasty saline ring of waves into the shape of her desire. A rhombus, which is to say a diamond. A diamond, after all, could pierce in four directions at once, whichever way her foes came at her. 
Within the four walls of her diamond, she and her 15 angels would be safe. And so into this shape, the god froze the waves of Lake Amula, enormous fortifications of compacted ice. These she set as palisades of protection for herself and her angels, as long as her precious ones remained within the prescribed boundaries, her unmeltable, unevaporable, impenetrable ice walls, smooth as volcanic glass, hard as adamant. Then, the god promised, the walls would protect them. Nothing that crawled, flew, limped, or slithered out of the desert could harm them, not even demons, not even other gods. With the very last of her strength, she pulled a palace out of the drying salt pan that had been the floor of Lake Amula. Salt, the philosophers say, is a substance especially dear to the gods, being, as it was, anathema to demons. The gods' new palace was dazzlingly white, a kilometer-long corridor crowned in colossal domes, its walls and halls of compressed halite, its honeycombed chambers shaped like shells of all different varieties, and all its doorways arches. But now the god had spent herself spilling out almost until, unto self-emptying. She was everywhere in the pristine ice of the Serac, and she was at its salt-white center too, and being everywhere was also diminished. More tired than any god has ever been tired, she beseeched her angels to make a home of her palace. It was theirs now, she said, to guard and be guarded by while she rested. So declaring, she stretched out on an altar of sparkling rock salt, not white like the rest of the palace, but glowing like the gigantic doors of the main corridor, pink and damp as the, glow, as the flesh of the inner lip. And finally, finally on this crystal bed she slept. And while she slept in tender form, the angels descended upon her and devoured her. <laughs> thus perished the god Galethel. And thus was born Galethel, the angelic city. Angels, I'd told Alazar when I was eight, and freshly appalled to discover I was his saint, have always been assholes. <laughs> you have no idea, said Alazar. Thank you. My name's Nina McLaughlin. I um, wrote a book called Wake Siren, which is a retelling of Ovid's Metamorphosis, told from the perspective of the female figures who were transformed. <laughs> Um, and I'm going to read Medusa tonight, which I haven't read to people before. Um, it's a short one, uh, and I, it's also one I assume that most of you guys are familiar with the story of Medusa. <clears throat> it's a little bit, it's a little bit violent. <laughs> Translators build the bridges. The chasm between languages is a deep ravine of silence. So what can we do but trust that, tr that the translator's bridges are sturdy, will carry the weight of meaning from one side of the ravine to the other? But all these bridges are faulty, hitches and chinks, because one language cannot cross over to another language unaltered and unflawed. And some of these bridges lead meaning into exile which is where this story has been living. Far removed from its home, I am the home of this story. After thousands of years of other people's tellings of all these different bridges, of the wrong words leading meaning into, in truth astray, I'll tell it myself, the story of how I got my snakes. It's short. Let's be specific. These were the colors of my hair, wheat, copper, and mahogany. It fell in waves down my back. See it, wheat, copper, and mahogany. I was this tall, and when I told people I was this tall, they always said, you seem so much taller. I was one of those people who seemed taller than I was. I stood up straight, and I carried myself with force. I remember how I was. A certain sort of voice tells the story long enough, and part of you ends up believing it. In hearing the telling of my story, I have heard the words seized and rifled. I have heard the word deflowered. I have heard the words attained her love. The words have made me question, was I wrong? Was it maybe not that bad? Was I just not strong enough to handle it? Attained her love. 
this euphemism, this shorthand, this obscuring, let me tell you. Neptune, who smells like the sick, muddy rot of low tide, forced me into the temple of Minerva. He grabbed a fistful of my hair and yanked it so hard I screamed. The words for what happened next are not seized and rifled, not deflowered, and not attained her love. The word is force. The word is violence. Violation, force, chaos, force, violence, chaos, force, violence, rape, 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 rape. Let's say what it was. He put his body where I did not want his body, and this was the moment I was amputated from myself. Minerva stood there and hid her eyes and didn't help. Untouched, above it all, she was disgusted that this thing should happen in her holy place, this desecration. But she wasn't mad at Neptune. He went back to ruling the seas, unscathed, unpunished, continued with his life as though returning home from a morning's errand to the butcher and the bank. Got what he wanted, went on his way, not me. I did not get what I wanted, and I did not get to continue on with my life as it was. I was the one who was punished by Minerva. It started as a tugging, a tightness across my scalp, as though some large fist had grabbed my hair and pulled my waves of hair, its rich color, its thickness, all of it tightened, coiled, twisted, I put my hand up to my head and ripped my hand away where there was hair, now muscled, creatures writhed and hissed, scaled and with eyes that burned. The snakes grew from my scalp like thick carnivorous vines rising from the rich pulpy soil of the marrow of my skull. I became a serpent-headed calamity and Neptune rules the deep. He did not rifle me or deflower me, and he sure as fuck did not attain my love, I'll tell you. He forced his body on my body, a tidal wave of foul water, and in all the tellings and retellings, no one got it right. And my words can't get there either. They're closer, though. They're closer, I'll tell you that. And another thing, it wasn't just the twine and snarl of the snake nest on my head. I deserved more punishment than that for the crime committed against me, vilified further for the wrong this so potent god force did against me. So to look upon me, to see my monstrosity, was also to be turned to stone. I watched as people's eyes would fall on me and the horror of their faces as their limbs filled with wet cement, curing, hardening, stilling them for all time in stony rictus. My hall is a menagerie of statues, an exhibit of a perverse and masochistic sculptor carving different personifications of fear. I was too much. I was too much for anyone to bear. It was the most terrible thing to horrify a person into paralysis, to know with every encounter that I am a monster too frightening for anyone to see or touch or love. I am so lonely. I have been in exile so long. So many other people have tried to tell my story. For a long time, it made me disbelieve what I knew was true. Now, I tell it myself with the force of the words that I choose. And the last thing I'll tell you, it's not the snakes that are so petrifying to people. It's not the serpents writhing from my head that turn people to stone. Don't you know, it is my rage. I hope for a day when a fury as white hot as mine can be held by another, accepted, understood, maybe even shared. I am not optimistic, and in the meantime, the statues in my hall grow in number and cast gruesome shadows on the floor. Thanks. My name is Sonia Tate. Uh, my most recent book is Forget the Sleepless Shores from Lefe Press. And I thought of reading two short things, one of which is a piece out of Forget the Sleepless Shores that Claire is responsible for. <laughs> because you'll remember um, a couple of years ago in some very stray Facebook post, 
Um, she referred enigmatically to her New Year's as parties and seaweed and Roman emperors. And uh, the parties didn't make it into the story, but everything else did. <laughs> so, I'm, so the story is called Imperator Noster and it's, it's your fault. <laughs> He was the Emperor Retiarius, and he never ruled from Rome, but they called him Caesar and Imperator nonetheless. Who else would rise from the Tiber mouth with laurels dripping green or grey than the waves of Terranum, a glistening rust furl of cloak pinned at the shoulder with a whelk? He laughed at the name of Neptunus. He refused the Greek trappings of split-tailed Triton, his shins grieved in armour the pale gleam of an oyster's inner shell. His cuirass was of the same twisting pearl, ornamented with small snails and figures of murex red algae that crawled so slowly an observer could not mark the changes, except by glancing down to see their stances had shifted. The riding figure was kneeling now, the head bent before an edge of water that a moment ago had been crown spiked rays of sun, and then a tree was a stream, and then the figure was rising, and then the waves had swallowed it. Caligula had claimed victory over him, he said while Claudius had given him a tribute of land. His trident was bronze barbed, taking his weight as if he stood on sand where ships of Egyptian grain rode low in the harbour. His eyes were blacker than mussels, than onyx or opal, or depth in the eyes of drowned men. None saw him come ashore. Some say he could not. The sailors kept to Ostia's docks and prayed. The emperor at Rome treated with him, they say, sent rings of jacinth and chalcedony mined in desert lands, wreaths and bowls of gold that never would perish beneath the sea, berry bright still as silt settled on them in the endless twilight, perfumed oils and flasks of faience and honey-coloured glass that would not melt in the warmest swells. The emperor at Ostia left the chests on the wharf side, carelessly opened to the swift and the sun. Returning at dawn, the Roman envoys found them filled with slippery weed and glittering scales, stinking like low tide and fishmongers. Dumped out on the planks in disgust, they clattered with lumps of wet amber, pearls in strange colours, cut with letters even the grammarians could not read. The emperor at Rome sent a cup in silver, chased like a coin of old Sicily with Scylla at her sea hunt. The emperor Retiarius left a necklace carved in day pink coral, the leaves and waving stems of some sea plant, out of which emerged women's faces and hands, water streaming, mouths open as if in song. The elder of two envoys held it and said it was wet cold to touch, chilling as a tunny's skin. The younger said it hummed in his hands and he dropped it. He sat all night at the foot of the lighthouse, peering out over the silver darkened sea. He saw nothing in the water but the reflections of fire above him, its devouring roar louder than any Nereid could sing. The Emperor of Rome was no fool and sent a toga of Tyrian purple, embroidered with gold as heavily as a sunset. The Emperor at Ostia was no fool and left it glinting in the morning sun, the embroidery replaced with fingernail rainbows of mother of pearl. The Emperor sent no more gifts, the Emperor returned none. The boats began to go out from Ostia again, the trade ships to come in from Alexandria and Rutupii and Cartago Noa. There are no more sightings of a man as pale as washed ivory standing where water should bear no one's weight, no more rumours of eyes open beneath the clear salt swirl, hands catching at poles or slapping the sides of skiffs, hawsers tangling in cormorant black hair. Pearls and amber, necklaces and nacre were filed away in the coffers of Rome, where perhaps the emperor thought of them sometimes and perhaps not. He was not a philosopher, this emperor. He looked out on the sea from his marble balconies at Baiae and called it ours. The younger envoy called the sea nothing. He was drowned in a storm off Corsaira, taking passage among a mixed cargo of garum and glassware. He might have gone down singing. None of the sailors heard him. The survivors clung to their splinters and prayed to the gods of sea swell, of seventh waves, fishermen's mercy for the catch too small to keep. Days away down the sea roads, a man who had once kicked over seaweed on Ostia's docks woke in tears, imagining a colleague he had not seen in years stood before him like Hector to Aeneas, dressed in garments as wet and shining as sheets of sea rack. His eyes had blackened, his fingers were cold as fish skin as he put a coin in the older man's hand folded his palm closed around the crusted thing. It was stamped with the face of an emperor, proud as a wolf, the crown in his hair slick-leaved, brine running from it. On the reverse, a trident circled by small fish and snails. He woke with a palm full of water, no colder or more salt than crying. When he whispered the name of Caesar, he was not thinking of Rome. And And this is the very first scene of a story that I just had accepted by Nightmare Magazine. 
It, it's called Tea with the Earl of Twilight. The title was given me by a friend of mine, Maddie Joyner, in the UK, um, whom I promised something like eight years ago to write a canal punk story. Uh, I think this may be it. Uh, when, when actually asked to describe it, what I've been saying is it's really angry about gentrification and climate change. <laughs> For the first week, she thought he belonged to the power plant. After that, she knew better. She had read the obituaries. She saw him first as a silhouette, one more line of the industrial geometries overhanging the boardwalk of Broad Canal. It had been a wet, dispiriting winter full of gusts and mists, but with January, the water had finally hardened into a thick pane of cormorant black ice, chipped and glossed with refreezing like volcanic glass. It was pond green at the edges of the channel where the stubs of older piers stood up like snags but the snow lying over the floating dock of the canoe launch could still pretend to seasonal pallor if the fanned brown branches of the trees along the old towpath could not. Decades after the coal barges of the Cambridge Electric Company, she had been vaguely surprised that there were still girder-framed docks and doors at canal height, but a sodium light burned above one recessed portal and the greenish silver of mercury vapor above the other, and someone had put out a wheelie bin on one of the rust-sketched catwalks, just as if a landfill-bound tugboat might still chug by. On the other, a slender man in black was smoking. More than features or expression, she registered the pose, slouched lankily over the caution yellow pipes of the handrail as if he had a view of something better than pilings, pedestrians' feet, the algae marked and iron stained masonry on the other side of the canal. Whatever she saw of his face was pale and pointed, his hair rumpled dustily. He wore no coat in the cold, but she had been caught wrong footed by climate change herself. He did not glance up at her as she passed, hard heeled with her hands in the pockets of her pale raincoat. She was not sure afterward why she had thought he should. If the biscuit-colored blocks and towers of the Kendall cogeneration station looked like a space age set from the 70s, Sid Eilerstein could not help thinking of the frictionless stack of glass cubes that housed her latest temp job as the apocalypse according to Ballard, all aquarium windowed open plan just waiting for the waters to rise. At least it left her full name off her ID badge, which spared her having to explain the kind of parents who named their daughter Sidney, like the second coming of the pre-Raphaelites, and got instead a two-time grad school dropout with a lavender gray undercut and tattoos just far enough up her sleeves to pass as an acceptable office drone. <laughs> she could take the bus on days when the red line preferred not to, and she walked... <laughs> it's a very Boston story. <laughs> And she walked quickly enough to spend most of her lunch breaks by the Charles, the traffic humming across the metal decking of the disused drawbridge's leaves. <laughs> Daniel referred to all of her employers interchangeably as Viridian Dynamics. She reminded him that his radical queer game design brought in approximately enough to cover the cost of internet in Spring Hill. <laughs> Even on the third floor of a former Philadelphia style so haphazardly converted that one of Daniel's boyfriends had not entirely joked about raccoons falling into the ceiling while they fucked. <laughs> it was better than medical transcription and waiting tables. She tried not to fall into hoping that it would last through the spring. She hurried with the rest of the nine to fivers through mornings as gray as salt streaked concrete, dusks as drowned blue as a harbor's underside, and sometimes she saw the man on the loading dock above the canal smoking next to the sign that read private property. He looked more like an art student than a utility worker in his thin black sweater and dark corduroys, his hair ashy in the mercury light. A match flare lit him from underneath like a storyteller at Halloween. <laughs> After the third or fourth sighting, she wondered if he was watching people in his own covert way or merely the motionless water. In hindsight, she liked to pretend everything would have been different if she had actually gone out that weekend night with Tari, but they were coughing their way through some kind of post-conference hell cold, and in the end she was just as happy to do nothing more strenuous than make skillet griddled grilled cheese and curl up to read. Looks like your industrial sort of thing, Daniel appended the link with a name she did not recognize in the title. He was only at the other end of the couch, sharing the other half of the amorphous sage-colored throw against the perpetual draft from the windows, but Sid had learned within weeks of their friendship that her housemate would never read a sentence aloud when a swipe and click would do. <laughs> Jeffrey Axtell, portraitist of Boston's waterways, dead at 79, read the headline on Universal Hub. The details in the Globe obituary were sparing. The accompanying headshot sh showed a sharp-faced man in salt and pepper middle age grinning at the camera, no tormented artist even with a half-finished canvas behind his shoulder. It looked blocky, architectural. All his paintings as she scrolled through a search had the same almost metallic crispness. Bright flat pastels or unmixed oils sharpened the one degree past photorealism that made the brutalist bricks of City Hall Plaza or the tumbling bronze dolphins of the old New England aquarium seem to scratch their way off the screen. He painted the tideless chop of the Charles like steel-cut scales, the spill of sunset under the Lechmere viaduct like cranberry glass. 
sunlight cross hatched through the rusting truss trusses of the Northern Avenue Bridge as if it were being rolled and stamped hot. Human figures moved through his city like afterthoughts, brush strokes for scale, an esplanade dog walker, hull ferry commuters, a smoker by the factory ripple of a canal. Slack jawed as a teen in some stupid found footage, Sid heard herself say, oh shit, so distinctly that Daniel mid podcast gave her a quizzical frown. <laughs> Between the hard blue planes of the water and the dirty orange static of sodium light, the figure in loose jointed lines of black paint leaned on the rail where the reflection of the power station scattered in green and dun and sulfur, not yet shadowed by a boardwalk, the saffron ember of a cigarette smoldered in one hand. She read the title first, The Earl of Twilight, and then the date of completion, 1981, and she closed the profiler interviewer gallery archive so fast the rest of her tabs went with it. Her hands felt as cold as if she had fallen through the canal's ice. For a moment, she wanted to scream at Daniel, his ears obliviously stopped with eldritch horrors that could never be worse than fiction. But it passed like the raw tin taste in her mouth, and after another moment, she opened the picture again. It must be twilight, that lowering ghost blue air. She knew even then, as with every real haunting, it had always been too late. I would like to start off by saying, wow, those readings were really good. <laughs> and um, I think uh, we have a selection of authors this time who each have uh, taken uh, bits of folklore and uh, mythology and classical stories and deconstructed them and put them back together in very unique ways. But I would like our panel of authors tonight to describe in their own words what they write and if they decide to describe their most recent project, that's also fine. <laughs> um, and I will start by untangling my microphone <laughs> and I guess picking on Sonia. Is that all right? No pressure. No pressure. <laughs> all right. Um, the problem with answering the question, the kind of fiction I write, is that someone came up with a really good description for it, uh, and it was my mother. So. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to sound like, you know, an Alan Sherman album title, uh, you know, my son, the folk singer, my daughter, the liminal writer. <laughs> my, my mother has said that what I write is liminal fiction, and I like that so much. I've been identified as a writer of mythic fiction. I've been identified as a writer of weird fiction. I happen to like weird fiction, so I'm pretty cool with that. Um, but I am really interested in borderlands and overlapping zones. Um, I had a very good teacher once who talked about the difference between the countries of either or and the countries of both and. And I like hyphenated things. I like things that only can exist in hyphens. Um, so I should probably at this point just start putting it in all of my bios. You know, her mother says she writes liminal fiction. <laughs> um, I do a little bit of everything. I, I wrote a memoir that came out in 2015, which was about leaving my journalism job. I worked for the Boston Phoenix. I don't know if any of you guys remember yeah. the Boston Phoenix. Yeah. Yes. RIP. Um, for many years and left that job and worked as a carpenter for nine years. And so my first book was nonfiction about leaving my journalism job to learn the carpentry trade. Um, I write a column for the Boston Globe about New England literary news, which appears every Sunday in the art section. Um, this is This is my first work of fiction. Mm. Um, uh, and I have a book of a sort of a collection, of, a long essay that's coming out in April um, uh, about the summer solstice. So it's, it's sort of a little bit of a mix. And this happened in a really fast and unpredictable way. I had studied classics in college and sort of always have loved these stories um, and sort of wrote this as a way. I had just finished a season of carpentry and, and sat down and wanted to get my writing brain back into shape and sort of decided to just rewrite one of these stories and then very quickly this whole book happened um, really unexpectedly. Um, uh, I can tell you what I'm writing right now. I just finished a accidental novel about weird angels Yay. and last year I drafted two things that I'll be working on later and one's called I Will Make a Ruin of Myself which is about a person who's a house, like houses can be people, they get folded down and then they're walked to their different locations if somebody buys them or whatever. Um, and sh you're not supposed to, when you fold up a house or a property into a person, there shouldn't be any people on that property. 
because it's really bad when you fold up a person inside a house and they're a person. So um, anyway, so it's kind of like about a haunted house, but you're haunted by a person. There you have it. I mean, I guess it's fan. I mean, I write fantasy, but I think all of fiction falls under that umbrella. Though when I try to write fiction, fiction, I fail. <laughs> and so I, I, I'm happiest. I'm happiest, I think, in a secondary world, partly because I can do a lot of research about this world and then also make up my own stuff. And when I try to write like straight up historical fiction, I fail because I don't know, I never know enough to write it right or true. But if I just make things up, I'm like, well, it's sort of like 1910 in America, only I made up 90% of it. <laughs> and nobody can call me on it. It's very fine. And that's sort of what I write. All right. <laughs> Well, I really enjoy your 90% uh, invented 1910 America, personally. It was trying to figure out a way to, to succinctly describe Des Demona and the Deep, and I just started talking about the Radium Girls, and I, I was like, I swear, this connects, and also there's fairies in it, and, I was, or, and goblins, specifically. Uh, but I wanted to pick out something you mentioned. When you write fiction, fiction, you said you fail, which I have not seen yet, so I can't judge for myself. But I, Claire, I wanted to ask you and uh, the rest of the panel, what draws you to the fantastic? Or what drew you to the fantastic for this specific project? Nina, do you want to? Oh, wow. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> we locked eyes, and that, I had to pick on you. Um, sure. Um, yes. Yeah. Um, I sort of feel like this this project, in some ways, um, gosh, it felt really sort of out of my control. I, I I wrote this book quickly. It took about three months, and and it was sort of in this gosh, like this sort of like extendo, <laughs> like trance state kind of. Like I, this was all I was doing, um, and and it was sort of like I, you know, I did one of these stories, and I was like, oh wow, that that felt pretty good. The first one was the story of Callisto who gets turned into a bear and then is sent up into the constellation. Um, and, and I started at the, the first two sentences, I am a bear, I live in the sky. And it felt like, wow, okay, this, <laughs> this feels neat. Um, and, and it just kept coming and coming. Um, so it was not, it was definitely not planned. Um, like I said, uh, yeah, it was almost like alarming, you know? Yeah. Like it did, it was almost uncomfortable. <laughs> I mean, it was amazing. I hope I hope I have another writing experience like this. Uh, I, I don't think I ever will. <laughs> um, so, when 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 you were studying classics, did you read Catullus? A little bit, yeah. So, Catullus sixty Catullus sixty three um, is the one of his poems that is an apillion, which is what you call an epic poem when it's short. Uh, you probably write apillia. You should just say that now. Um, but it's, it, it's, it's, it's the story of Addis and Sibele and it's absolutely fantastic. Um, it, it has divinity as like this violent thing that comes out of nowhere and happens to people, bit of a theme. Um, it, has, it has gender changing, um, it has waking up the next morning and going, oh my god, why did I castrate myself in the service of a goddess? <laughs> Uh, who has not asked ourselves this at one point or another? It um, just happens sometimes, you know. But but it but it ends with one of the best anti-invocations that I know, and you saying you know that you were doing nothing but writing, you know, the voices. Um, Catullus sixty three is is the one that ends pleading, you know, the great goddess, stay away from me, you know, wow, wow. go go inspire others, go make others mad, oh, keep wow. all your madness far from my home. Oh wow, so. amazing. <laughs> So you said that, that is what I thought yeah. of. Wow, great. And nice. uh, if I'm intended to answer the actual question, <laughs> um, I, I, don't, I don't think that I write purely mimetic fiction because it doesn't seem to happen. Yeah. Um, and the things, that, the things that I'm interested in are always what happens when something from elsewhere mm -hmm. comes in or what happens when someone is from elsewhere. Uh, and the closest I've ever actually gotten is I, I envy your ability to write things that are 1910, but you made 90% up because I fall down research k-holes. So I, I have a story, for example, that's set in 1930s Ireland and it has a bog body and it's almost not mimetic, except that somebody's having a relationship with a bog body. Wow. <laughs> and there are significant dreams and um, a murder happened. 
And that's the closest I have managed to get to writing historical fiction with like not ghosts or random apparitions or <laughs> the very first story I ever wrote, somebody is walking on a beach and the severed head of Orpheus rolls up in the tide at their feet. <laughs> and so this is the sort of thing that just happens to people in my stories and I apologize to them, but this is just how it is. <laughs> Can you repeat the question? <laughs> oh, why do uh, I write fiction or, or this fiction? Why do you write this fiction? Yeah, and take that however you want, really. I had a dream, I don't know, seven or eight years ago, and I, I woke up, I was like, that's a great idea. The saints getting sacrificed, weird angels, cool. Um, and then I wrote something that was like a big old mess, and I was like, this is great. And nobody else thought it was great um, because it was a really big old mess. But I get all starry-eyed about my first first drafts, which are really more like vomiting. And then, and then I always meant to do something about it, and I wanted to do something with the movies because I was like, it's fantasy, it's secondary world fantasy, but it doesn't have to be in medieval land, ye old medieval land. Like, what if it's just the beginning of their movies? So then I was like, well, I would have to like. What would movies look like in a place where there's also angels or in a different part of the continent there'd be goblins or gods or fairies, but they also get movies. So what, what do angels think about movies? Like, oh, like, and then, so like, then the world building starts, but you have to do a lot of research to make up a world because you have to first kind of know how this world works so you can break it. <laughs> and that's got like, I don't know, that's why I was writing this one because I was kind of a little bit curious about you know, those uh, uh, like movies before talkies and how do you load the take up reel and all of that and, and why did things suddenly spontaneously catch fire and, um, and then what does that look like when you're living in a city made of salt and when do we get to the sacrifices which happens almost immediately and keeps happening. <laughs> so I was really interested in all of that and now it's done and I'll be interested in something else. <laughs> Uh, Nina, I think you were like talking a bit about like flow state, the thing that happens to you and then you just sort of get involved in that process. Uh, and I wanted to ask uh, each of you, do you outline or is outline the farthest thing from your uh, writing process that you can think of? And whoever wants to answer it first may. Claire. I'll do it. <laughs> so Carlos and I, we, um, we talk about outlining, it's often we, so some people start start their process by outlining and we generally um, outline after our first draft because first you have to kind of have a thing before you can say what the thing is and then give it a skeletal structure and then almost immediately when you do your revision the outline that you've intended to give it de deliquesces <laughs> it's no longer necessary or accurate it's just it's also, it's also there, but it's not even relevant anymore, but you needed it to get to the next step. It focuses you in a weird way, or us, that's how it works for us. Um, flow state, like I, I love the ecstatic state of writing. Um, and when I, uh, and uh, for a long time, I've worked, it was working on really long projects where I was on my fourth or fifth revision. It takes years and years. And I was like, I will never feel happy again <laughs> <laughs> writing. And then I took a break after I finished a few things and then, got that like what if like staring out a window but it had been years since I had the what if of did the desire to write all by itself with nobody looking at me or expecting me anything from me and I thought oh like so so it's okay you know like I'm not writing because people think I should and I'm not writing because the last 25 years of my life have been dedicated to it this I could just write because I want to write and to make sure that I still wanted to write this is very rare it's, it was increasingly rare to feel that um, so it was a, that was a gift of last year and so now that I'm in the midst of a, like so under several deadlines right now I'm feeling slightly more miserable but I remember it's it's recent enough memory to be like that's still attainable and and that is still the reason to keep going you know so I feel like like to realize that you can that that state is still enterable and possible is a beautiful thing to look forward to <laughs> yeah totally and I, it's funny like i all i've done in my life is read books and so writing this first book this nonfiction book about my actual life i was like well shoot i'm gonna know how to write a book you know and um and i didn't and it took like 11 drafts and you know three and a half years um uh i don't usually use outlines when I'm doing nonfiction I make lists and I and I always write a, head, a heading saying elements to include mm -hmm. um, and just sort of make a pile and then kind of shift them around as I'm going um, and and with Wake Siren um, 
it, you know, it was not, I mean, the outlines were in Ovid, you know, I mean, I was, I was basing the stories there. Um, so it was a way, way different process. Um, I, I don't outline at all. Um, I always hated being asked to turn in an outline of a paper beforehand. He's like, I don't know what it looks like because I haven't written the paper. <laughs> this is decades in my past. Um, the, th the things that I write are short fiction and poetry and film criticism. And the film criticism does function slightly differently in that I usually wind up writing about a movie because something about it really snags me either. Like, this is amazing and people need to see it or um, this bothers me so much that I'm going to write about it until I have sorted out either why or I just tell people, oh my God, this is a thing that exists. You should give it a wide berth and possibly set it on fire if you see it. <laughs> um, or, you know, this one particular thing really worked for me and the rest of it is just sort of eh, or that's neat, that exists. Um, I have a great deal of difficulty being neutral about movies and just being like, that is a movie that I saw. If you want to know who was in it, there are some names, they have faces, they said lines. It was presumably written by some people and someone had to be behind the camera to film it. <laughs> um, so, so, th so those are slightly more organized in that there's always like a, th there is a thesis or an argument to the reviews. And in that sense, I think they have more internal structure. Um, the fiction generally just starts with pure pearl grit and it's like here's something that I really need to get out of my head onto the page and then if necessary I will figure out what the rest of it is doing. Um, I don't write linearly, for example. Like it is very, very rare for me to start a story with the first line and then actually end it with the last line. Um, they are usually very much out of order and the thing that it, the thing that turns at first turns out to be something in like the last third of the story that I have to write my way toward in order to figure out what it's actually doing and then once I've gotten that far I have to figure out what happened after it you know that that actually made it three quarters of the way through. Um, I suspect parts of my hindbrain of doing plotting for me but not bothering to inform me and I would really <laughs> like it if at least they just started leaving like notes on the refrigerator or something. I will accept an odd couple situation, <laughs> you know, but like right now we're still at the, it took me three days to figure out F.U. was Felix Unger. <laughs> did, you, did you use the word pearl grit? Yes, I did. That's great. That's <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so I wanted to um, uh, ask, uh, you three, one last question before opening it up to the audience, which, by the way, your uh, question likely will be filmed, uh, just to FYI. Uh, but my question is, what drink or food, uh, whatever, would you pair with the piece you read for us tonight? <laughs> Claire has had a heads up, so. It's just that this is full of food, right? Because the angels give you venisons, otherwise you wouldn't be able to eat because everything in this city comes from the angels or else. And so like in a movie theater, you have to ask for like venison popcorn. They have something called venison wine, which the laity called beer. So like, you know, popcorn and beer basically except it's angelic. <laughs> Do you, do you wanna do you wanna go? I'm still frantically talking. <laughs> I I'm trying to think of like something like tentacular. I don't mm. think you should eat octopus. I really don't. Um but that's what I'm that's the thing that's coming into my brain. Something made with squid egg, perhaps? Yeah, squid egg oh. pasta. Yeah. Ooh. Or what? What were you gonna say? I had a drink once. Um, there, there was a bar, well, there's a restaurant called Waypoint in Cambridge. They made squid ink mezcal once. Oh it was my gosh, dark that's it. That's it. That Great. Really perfect. <laughs> perfect. <laughs> perfect. Right. perfect. I, I would like your book and like a squid ink mezcal shot. Uh, I came up with that without managing to think of something for my own. <laughs> you can do it. So. Um, I have at home a 300 year old glass onion bottle, which means that it has the shape of a narrow neck and then it widens out. Um, a friend of mine gave it to me about 14 years ago and it came up out of a shipwreck. It's full of sand and salt and bits of shell. It's worked its way into two of my stories. So I'm going to go with whatever it originally held is the drink of choice, and I'm just going to hope it was something like rum. <laughs> so the ghost of a drink yes. for your ghost story. Yes. Oh, thank you. Very nice. Uh, so any questions from the audience? Mm -hmm. 
Well, in that case, I have w another question. Uh, what are your favorite and least favorite tropes to play with and consume, and are they different? Like tropes that you read or watch <laughs> movies about versus ones you actually like to write or create art about? Claire. So um, this, this one has uh, female friendships in it, uh, like very, very deep and dear and fierce. Um, they don't have a lot of time together to be friends, but they're friends, you could, they're sort of friends that, you know, you meet once and if you meet again in another 20 years, you pick right back up. Um, I really like that. And I don't see enough of how I recognize my own friendships in the media, hardly anywhere. Um, a little bit in Russian Doll, maybe. Or, or um, the spy who dumped me definitely had like a little bit of what I actually recognize as real friendship in a movie, which is very rare. Um, and uh, a friend of mine, Sharon Shin, pointed out, she's like, oh, yeah, everybody has their thing they write about. And you are always writing about death and what happens after. Probably a lot like you. <laughs> but, but I mean, there are so many people who die in this story and then just get resurrected and one who doesn't. But like, there's just like constant death, but it's also like, constant like plucking them right out and then shaking them up and saying how do you like that um, <laughs> so those are two things things I don't like I mean I hate I hate like in television I hate when somebody's like you lied to me and then they leave the room and slam the door it's like nobody stays and be like you want to talk about this <laughs> you want to tell explain yourself but it's like everything ends so abruptly and and it's or or somebody was like you know, I don't like your face, and then they punch them in the face, and that and that's like how people solve problems, and and then like in the next episode, it's like it never happened. That drives me nuts. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think things that I find I return to um, is transformation and change. Does that count as a trope? Yeah. yeah. Okay, great. Um, and I'm gonna think about tropes I don't like. Well, you answer. <laughs> um, things that come up in my stories over and over again uh, time, hauntings, memory, the sea I do occasionally write about other landscapes a thing that I keep actually meaning to write more about is trees I happen to like them quite a lot but they don't seem to crop up the same way that oceans or rivers or Adam yeah <laughs> hey that counts as desert I'm totally <laughs> counting that one um, yeah, uh, science is a recurring theme, science history, ways that memory gets lost and fragmented and reconstructed and retold. Um, those are probably more abstract than things like tropes, although I really, I, I, I also hate miscommunication as, as a plot driver like movies or stories where it's just like, you guys could have had a conversation in chapter two, and I understand that the rest of the plot wouldn't have happened, but also I wouldn't have wanted to shake everybody involved from chapters two through 18. <laughs> um, love triangles I find surprisingly annoying. Um, obligatory het romances, where it's like, ah yes, you're in the right gender and you made eye contact once, boom! <laughs> it's like, <laughs> that's, that's not how it works. Um, which probably makes it um, interesting, as I vainly attempt to eschew the adjective ironic and fail, um, that a lot of the stories that I write do have relationships at their heart. I am interested in how people relate to each other, but I very much hope that I have never written an obligatory het romance in my life, or at least if I have, it was like at the start of my career and I can bury it. <laughs> um, uh, writers writing about writers <laughs> and poems about poetry um, make me nuts. Excellent. Yeah. Oh, there's a hand. Yeah, there is a hand. Someone. That was a perfect segue because my question is, um, what sort of writers and writing do y'all see your work as um, like uh, in a lineage of or from, uh, in community with, or like in conversation with? Okay, so the question is, what sort of writers or writing do you see uh, your work in communication or in lineage with? Okay, I'll do it. <laughs> you can give me those big I, eyes. I was like, yes, yes, whatever you want. <laughs> you give me the big eyes first. Did I? Yes. Oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> 
because I'm not aware of my big eyes. <laughs> They're uh, very powerful. Okay. They are. Oh, that's nice. Thank you. Well, I think that's nice. It's hard to tell. Um, uh, okay, so the thing about lineage with, I mean, because I feel like I know, I know, I can say very clearly what I read as a child, what made me want to write and where I come from. And so I'm, I'm used to saying things like McKillop and McKinley and McCaffrey and Delint, you know, but I feel like the more I read and the older I get, the lineage is changing because, because like lately, what have I, I mean, like in the last five years, I've read, I've read uh, Dostoevsky and Shabon and The City in the City. And I feel like my, um, it's shifting or like Bujold happened in my thirties and, and I would not be anywhere without Bujold or without Murderbot. And what's wonderful right now in, is that I'm at a point in my life and career which I never did imagine and I never thought it was when you daydream about being a writer as a child you don't think about who you're going to grow up with and who are you going to be like your siblings you know or, or like or or your like fairy godmothers or, or your your honorary grandfather who are the family of writers who are physical and not just the people you're like imagining and imbibing and I feel like I've for whatever, like this, the genre, this community, I, I have all of these, oh, Amal calls them, my friend Amal, Emil Tar calls them shield sisters, but I feel like the people that, there's some people that I grew up reading that are now like close friends or family, and, and it's a startling uh, place to be in, but like Ellen Kushner, Delia Sherman, like people, people who helped make me who I am, and then, and then you like go over and help make them goose, do you know what I mean? So like, <laughs> Uh, I, I just feel it, it's, a, it's an odd place to be in and um, it's, it, it's a constantly astonishing place to be in and it doesn't ever quite end because you're always meeting more people and thinking, ah, I'm going to adopt Sean Elliott as my new brother, you know, and I thought I had enough brothers, but no, today I've discovered I have another one, you know, and it just, that keeps happening. Um, I agree in that sort of like continued astonishment is one of the neatest things um I, I you know with, with like a with a retelling like this i mean this is like this has been going on and i'm gonna list some big names that i don't consider myself sort of a part of or in conversation with but like shakespeare and james joyce and uh louise glick wrote a beautiful collection of um poetry called meadowlands which um sort of takes on the odyssey um uh for example um you know i mean so there's i mean the retellings go on and on and on there's too many to list and so I feel like I mean I feel like it sits very squarely in that in that conversation my professional training is as a classicist so I also have thank you um, you know but, but so so I also I, I understand what you're saying about having a lineage of people where it's like you know this is 80% of the western canon right, right, right. <laughs> I was like okay all right, I mean, I guess apparently I have some Horace. I feel really complexly about that, but he's probably in there somewhere. Um, and and I, I also, I, I agree with you that it is very astonishing to read someone as a child and then like grow up and have them like your writing or, you know, <laughs> hang out with them at a convention. And, and that that's, I, th I think that makes the idea of lineage and community much more intertangled than being two separate things. Like it's very safe with people who died before you ever encountered <laughs> them. You know, this is like why it is acceptable. I don't know if that's the right word. Um, hi historical Wittgenstein would probably be absolutely horrified by the fact that I find several things that he did adorable. He was not a man who related very well to the concept of adorability, but he used to like to get after he got out of a lecture, uh, got out of giving a lecture, he would go and he would get a pork pie and he would walk into a cinema in Cambridge and he would sit in the very front row and he would eat his pork pie and watch a musical starring Carmen Miranda or Betty Hutton because he absolutely adored big, splashy, stupid camp technicolor musicals. And I find the idea of Wittgenstein parked in the front row of a cinema in Cambridge watching like the gangs all here with Carmen Miranda eating a pork pie absolutely adorable. <laughs> And nothing that he does from the afterlife and no amount of glowering through the Tractatus is ever going to change that. <laughs> you know. So, but, but that's a lot simpler than the fact that like, you know, um, if I meet Jane Yolen at Boscon or something, there's like a 50% chance that, that I'm either going to say, hi, hello, how are you? Or she's like, <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> uh, because I read Sister Light, Sister Dark when I was nine, and that was a tremendously formative book for an entire laundry list of reasons that I'm not going to inflict on everyone. <laughs> And, and I, I like the fact that my writing lineage does include people who have been dead for thousands of years. Like, I am in a demographic where it is difficult to avoid Sappho being part of your lineage, but I don't feel bad about that. <laughs> um, and I like the fact that some of my lineage are people that I do hang out with and know personally. You know, like Gemma Files, who is an amazing Canadian horror and weird fiction writer, is someone who I encountered first through her fiction and is now one of the people who, when I finish a story and it is still in the white hot disaster phase, I'm like, I finished a thing! <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and that's really cool. Gemma Files' experimental film, by yes. the way, I was so <laughs> blown away by that novel, which is. And maybe some ways a ghost story as well. Um, and yes, I, I do the biz thing mm -hmm. with like Neil Gaiman and Holly Black, and I'm just like, oh my gosh, you're real, and you're looking at me with your eyes. What? And, and of course, they're like, I've just been on five panels. Yes. I have to interact with another person. Hi, how are you? Sidle off stage. Uh, I see a question back from April. When you read outside of the areas in which you tend to write, like the term genre is maybe not that useful here, but if you read in a, a genre other than where, you usually, where you're writing usually falls, um, do you ever notice stuff that you look at and say, ooh, I wish I saw more of that. I wish people who I'm really, in, I wish I, more other writers were doing that thing. That's so cool. Why don't we, whoever we is, do more of that? So so the question is, when you read outside your genre, what uh, things do you see outside, uh, outside the genre that you would like to see within it, that you would like to see other people play with? Is that? Yeah. Mostly. Okay. Um, not making eye contact, not doing it. <laughs> uh, Sonia, can I ask you to go first? Yes. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, so I, I read a lot of genre of fiction. Um, I also read a lot of nonfiction. When I'm not reading things that are broadly classifiable as science fiction, fantasy, horror, weird, mythic, blah, 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 um, a lot of what I have been reading lately um, is pulp and noir fiction from like the American mid-century or uh, not necessarily strictly American, but a lot of it is. Um, and I don't know if when I read other genres, I am necessarily always reading with an eye to, ooh, I wish people would do more of that, or, oh wow, I could do that. Um, but for example, there is a lot of fruitful ground to be found overlapping between noir and weird fiction. And people do explore it, but I also think that a lot more people could explore it. They're both genres of uncertainty. The entire deal with noir is not that the universe is a foredoomed place full of black irony that will crush you like a beautiful lady's heel grinding out a cigarette as she walks away. <laughs> Although you can do that if you like. There, there, you know. There, there are some very good examples of that. But the whole point is it's the genre where you can be going along in your daily life and everything that you think you knew drops out from underneath you. You know, um, your, your job isn't what you thought it is. Your relationships isn't what, aren't what you thought they were. Um, you did a favor for this guy on a corner and all of a sudden you are being pursued by a syndicate or possibly the entire um, institutional structures of patriarchy and the American dream are massively fucked and it's 1950 and you're not sure how to deal with that. <laughs> Um, and, and so, and, and, and weird fiction is very much the same way. Everybody knows what the sky looks like. Everybody knows what grass looks like. Everybody knows when you pick up a phone call, there's a living human being on the other end, right? No, <laughs> shit. Um, and so you do see crossovers of this sort, but I, f I feel like I would expect to see a lot more just because it is possible to run both of these genres simultaneously and at the same time, not even in parallel, crossing with one another. And, and it's wonderful, and some people do it very well. Um, the late Joel Lane has an amazing collection called Where Furnaces Burn, which is Birmingham weird noir. Um, that's very much worth reading. Um, 
there is at least one other major exemplar of this that has gone right out of my head because I'm trying to describe it. It exists, but usually you see things like people doing like Lovecraftian private eyes. Um, Cassandra Kaw's Hammer Cassandra on Bone Kaw. is an example of that, and it's very, very good. Um, I think there are aspects of it in Victor Laval's um, Ballad of Black Tom, which is a retelling of Lovecraft's The Horror at Red Hook. Um, but, but again, it's like there's so much fruitful ground there. There are so many ways the world can be uncertain. And when you write weird fiction, generally the uncertainty is supernatural. And when you write you know, straight up noir fiction, generally the uncertainty is more existential, but doesn't actually tip over into the universe itself being totally unstable. Um, there, there's a film called Repeat Performance from 1947, which if you can find it, I recommend seeing it because it is an original flavor first generation film noir that actually goes full supernatural and it is worth tracking down for that reason alone. It's astonishing. But again, it's like I would expect to see more of this. So apparently I do have a hobby horse about things I want to see more of from other genres. Thank you for coming to my TED talk. I'm going to leave it there. This was April. What this was, remind me, I'm sorry. This was I was April. so fascinating. April. Oh, what do we want to see more of? Yes. Uh, yeah. That we read in other, I read a lot of mystery. I love mysteries. They are so Beautifully plotted. Well, okay, I love Louise Penny. I don't know. I, I love, um, I, 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 there's a lot of mysteries I love partly because maybe there's some like reassurance in the structure. You have a problem to solve. And, and so, so in one way, you don't have to worry about plot. You are assured of something. And so th then everything else in a mystery, if it's a good mystery, is what's really interesting because the, um, the skeleton is assured. So like, so then it becomes um, a vehicle for talking about a certain period of history um, or it becomes a vehicle about uh, art and philosophy and um, politics or like that's so so mysteries when they're really good um, the last thing they're about is about mystery and it's it's more about who are the people that you care about in a situation that's almost always dire um, doing in, a, in, in like kind of in the most interesting thing about this about writing which is world building like in that part of the world that is complicated uh, so I guess like I, I love that and I so I know there's some people who do like serious mystery genre like mystery fantasy or mystery science fiction crossover some of Bujold's like uh, Vorkosigan saga are straight up mysteries like memory is a straight up mystery the way civil campaign is almost a straight up regency romance novel and I really I like the um the cross crossing genres of that I like the idea I know I've not read lies of Locke Lamora yet but I like the idea of a private investigator or somebody like navigating a fantasy world Okay, so put that aside. But I also love reading other people's letters. Like, um, I love Flo Flaubert's letters. Um, he's kind of a, you know, Flaubert. Um, but I learned the word lupinar just reading his letter. Like, the word lupinar appears everywhere. I'm like, ooh, that's such a pretty word. What's a lupinar? And suddenly, I have another synonym for brothel because he's always <laughs> at them. And I'm... <laughs> It's, it's all very, very exciting. Like, but then we were reading Van Gogh's letters to his brother. And, and so, you know, you, you know the song, Starry, Starry Night, and it's always in your head once it gets in your head for the rest of the week. You're welcome. And, um, but, but you know that, and you know, like, you, you know certain paintings that are just, you have, like, these visuals. But, you, but I'd never heard, like, Vincent's own voice talking to his brother saying things like, Oh, I'm, I'm feeling so good right now. I feel healthy because what I think about healthy is if I can eat a piece of bread, like one of like the strong um, like marine engineers, if they can eat one piece of bread all day and go strong from morning to midnight. And, and when I'm feeling like healthy, that, that's how I measure my health, by being able to eat one piece of bread and being satisfied. And it's just like, kind of what I'd love to see in genre is like, a, is somebody is just like a character who just writes letters to his brother about what he's reading and why it's important. Uh, Zola is so important to the, the picture of the revolutionary postman he's drawing at the moment and why he's drawing, why he's drawing a poet with flames around his head because it's important that a poet is haloed because he's holy. You know, like, but, but fantasy, like, it always has to have a plot. It always has to do something or say something or, you know, it has to have a... And I was like, well... Sometimes I just want to read like a book of somebody's letters talking about something else, but totally made up, you know, and I, and I, but th 
there's not really a market for that. So <laughs> you, you just made an excellent case that there should be. <laughs> Uh, what I tend to want to see more of, like, I love a good, like, well-plotted novel, uh, but I think a lot about uh, Jonathan Crowley's uh, Little Big, which is a story of the fair folk or fairies that just kind of wanders in and out of this family's life. Um, and I guess when I'm reading more mimetic or quote-unquote lit fic, how, how, yeah, quote-unquote, uh, the sort of, like, just wandering kind of narrative and sort of family... Mm -hmm. uh, looking through a family. I, I'm like, I, I'd like to see more of that in like fantasy and science fiction, just sort of like wandering in and out. I, I like the idea of stories that just hang out. Mm -hmm. I happen to like reading them or, or seeing them as well. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Sonia, when you were talking about the mashup of Lovecraft and noir, uh, actually the first place I encountered Lovecraft was uh, A Study in Emerald, oh. uh, Neil Gaiman's Sherlock Holmes and Lovecraft oh, mashup. Like oh yes, it is quite good. Um, so I think we have time for one more question. Um, the uh, blue shirt. Uh, I find a lot of times when I, when I write something, I like look back on it and be like, oh my god, this is derivative trash. And I'm clearly just like copying people who are smarter than me. And like, what have I done here? Do you have any advice for you know, finding your own voice or like kind of powering through that sort of thing, finding originality? Uh, do you have any advice for uh, finding your own voice? Nina. I think one of the things, one of the biggest parts for me has been quieting those voices. So it's, it's less, it's, it's, it, in some ways the work feels less about finding the voice and quieting those other voices. And just knowing, knowing that they're always those little demons that sit on your shoulder that say like, man, you suck, this is so bad and so dumb. <laughs> like, they're, they'll always come. And, and, and learning how to just be like, shh, 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 you know? <laughs> and I think that's, that's when you are able to do that, that's when you're gonna find the space to be able to find what your real voice is. And, and you say bug, I say feature. So like, like Stephen King talks about, he doesn't read anything for a little while before he starts writing because it would take on, it's like putting onions next to the milk in the refrigerator so the milk will smell like onions. But my mentor, uh, Gene Wolfe, would say, he's like, find the best thing that you love, like your favorite thing, read a page, type out the page, and then start typing your story. Like he, he was very interested in like, how, how closely can you sound like this person? Well, once you do that, like with 200 people, um, you know, <laughs> I didn't do that with 200 people. Like I listened, but I didn't follow his advice. But the point is, is that <laughs> I always remembered it though. But like, but it, first of all, would make you a very good mimic if you ever needed to write in the style of someone for fun to write a story. But second of all, that just gives you 200 great teachers. And I mean, we're all mimetic, like humans learn by mimesis, we learn and we imitate, and and then and then out of like this mashup of everything we see and absorb, then 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 the phoenix rises from that. So it, it just may be that you're just still absorbing, and and it could be that the, your first draft sounds like Lovecraft, and then you revise it, and 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 you think, well, I've seen that line before, like she smiled like the sunrise. Okay, so. No, I mean, so I know that I've seen that line and her lips were like red as roses and her eyes, like the received language that you, that you're like, it's, I wrote it because it was the first thing that came to mind. We, we, my husband and I call that the first thought. So then you're like, so what's the, what's another word for sapphires? That's the second thought. And then what's the furthest thing from sapphires I can think that's still blue? And the third thought may be your voice, you know, like, or maybe like, your third thought voice, which is a great, it's a great thing. You still have first and second, but that's why we revise, I think. Mm -hmm. Talking about 200, a mashup of 200 different people suddenly made me think of a writing exercise. Like if you are, if you're working on a piece and you do feel that like what has come out is, is too derivative of a different writer, like what if you go and read a bunch of somebody else completely different and go back to the draft? Mm -hmm. You know, like it, Sort of, sort of an extrapolation of what is the farthest thing you can get from sapphires and still be blue. You know, like how far could you push the style you're working in? Um, I'm, I'm, the, the hesitation is not just like brain fry. It's I'm, I'm trying to to articulate. The, there's a lot of 
There are a lot of different ways to have your own voice. Like some of it is prose style, but some of it is habits of mind. And it's actually very, very hard to think like any other specific person. Mm -hmm. um, I have, although most of my friend list is very, very fond of CJ Cherry, I have never actually read a novel of hers. It is something that I am working on. Um, and it has nothing to do with the prose style. It doesn't mean that I don't like her prose style. It doesn't mean that her premises aren't interesting. But the way that she thinks is, as far as I can tell, rotated like somewhere between 90 and a full 180 degrees from my own brain. And so like I have described the process of trying to read C.J. Cherry as trying to climb a glass model of someone else's brain. <laughs> and the ways in which she thinks are just very, very different. And so there are writers who have very different prose styles from me but whose habits of mind are very congenial. And so they're people, like they tend to be people whose plots make a lot of sense to me, or I can see exactly why they're juxtaposing the things that they're doing, or the structures of their books make sense on the very deep-rooted level. And then there are people where I might really like their language, but the structures are really alien, and those can be very interesting to read. And so, like, stylistically, if you are worried about sounding like somebody, that may be an okay stage to get through because what's underneath the style may in fact be wildly alien, both from the person that you feel like you're copying and from your beta reader who may be reading it and going, oh my God, I didn't see that coming. And you're like, how could you not see that coming? That was obvious from the second paragraph. You could tell from the way they shook hands. <laughs> and the beta reader is like, nope, that's, that's your brain. That's not mine. So, so, there, so there are a lot of different angles to have on your own voice and, and I think I, I think that structure often gets overlooked, for example, when people are talking about, you know, this is like such a, like, 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 like Tolkien's novels are structured incredibly weirdly. Here is a travelogue. Here is a flurry of action. Here is a history lecture. Somebody recites a poem. <laughs> you know, and like most people who imitate Tolkien actually do not imitate that, you know, like they imitate... Hey, you just described my structure and I was like, wait, uh, that's great! I was, I was working so hard not to be like Tolkien, so hard! <laughs> well, Tolkien didn't have cinemas. <laughs> it's true. It's so true. we're all good. <laughs> you know, but, but, I, but that's, that is not a very usual structure, I think, for people doing secondary world work. And I like that that's something you're doing, like all of these different layers. Oh, good, I didn't knock over my glasses. I was afraid that's what that noise was. <laughs> no, I, ju I um, just knocked over my pen. It's fine. <laughs> you know, and like, you know, people, te people tend to think of like, okay, I'm doing a secondary world novel, so I'm working in one specific register. Like, is this going to be a really mimetic secondary world novel? Like, am I going to know where every, I'm, am I going to know every single detail of this world right down to the license? plates, you know, <laughs> or, right, or is this going to be like, no, I'm going to throw everything at the wall that the story needs to be convincing and people can fill in the gaps for themselves. Um, there's, I, 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 pulp tangent, irrelevant. <laughs> um, there, there, there's, there's a writer named Frederick Nabel who wrote a series of short pulps stories and novellas in the 19, late 1920s, early 1930s um, called the Kennedy and McBride Mysteries, for which he made up his entire own New England city which I really, really love. Like this is, th this is something that gets to the point of accidentally like approaching genre fiction. Um, as far as I can tell, because he didn't want to set it anywhere actual. S he wanted a city where he could have like vast amounts of, you know, crime and complicated plots and corruption. It's called Richmond City. And from internal evidence, it is almost certainly somewhere in Connecticut. It is absolutely on what would now be the Northeast Corridor of the Amtrak Regional. It's an hour from Boston and like, you know, a, a bit more to New York. It's like, that's, that's Connecticut. And he does in fact describe it down to the license plates and, you know, like the movie theaters and the names of the different neighborhoods and their wards and, you know, like name, you know, um, stage theaters, burlesque shows, like actors who come through town. And then every now and then somebody gets on a train and like goes to Montreal and you're just like, <laughs> You know, and, and that's an amazing act of secondary world building that just happens to be in ostensibly realistic fiction somewhere in Connecticut during, you know, like, prohibition. <laughs> um, and, like, I, I, I think what this has actually turned into is a sequel to your comment about more stories where people just hang out. Like, <laughs> I, love, I love the fact that your fiction is very much and now a travelogue and now a poem, um, because I agree that, that people get stuck into ideas of what like fantasy looks like and this is ridiculous. That didn't have anything to do with the original question, right? <laughs> yeah. uh, well, I just... You uh, handed me a mic! I sure <laughs> did. Well, technically Nina handed you the mic. You handed me a mic! <laughs> uh, I actually, uh, in response to the question, I, I 
think um, when you start looking at your own writing and saying, this is so derivative, da 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 yeah, that, that what Nina was saying about like the demon on your shoulder, you got to learn how to like be like, okay, shut up now, um, <laughs> and just sort of keep writing your own thing. Um, Sonia's absolutely right. You, you might be doing something completely different, but because you're so close to the project, you don't see that. You see all the threads that lead back to the things it reminds you of. So I am right there with you. I, I am trying, I'm always like, oh, everyone will know what this is about. And I'm like, no, not, not, a, not necessarily. Um, so hmm, I think we're coming up on the end, uh, but I appreciate all the authors for um, coming here and answering my questions and giving us wonderful anecdotes. And uh, before we go, how can people keep up with you, uh, either online or off? I'll hand you the mic again. This is risky. It is. Um, I have a website. It is my first name and my last name dot com. Um, it, it, uh, it, it is built and maintained by my father, and I appreciate very much that he does this. Uh, other than that, I, um, I'm on Dream With because before that I was on LiveJournal. <laughs> and I'm Sove, S-O-V-A-Y, at Dreamwith. And I have a Patreon, which is also um, Sove, you know, on Patreon. And that's for the film criticism. Um, I, am, I am not on Twitter. I am not on Tumblr. And mostly what I do on Facebook is lurk. Thanks, <laughs> <laughs> um, McLaughlin.com, very basic and boring website. Um, and then Twitter, same. Instagram, same. The usual ways. <laughs> Um, so csecooney.com is uh, my website, CSC Cooney is Twitter. I like to retweet people and occasionally tweet word count. Um, uh, Facebook is sort of where, it, like after LiveJournal fell, I didn't, I didn't migrate to, to Dreamscape, Dreamwith, dream with, uh, though I do, but I get your like, like newsletter alert in my email, but then I can never sign in and comment, and the two times I could, the next time I couldn't, so anyway, I read your stuff, but I can't always comment on it, which is, I an, it's it. just harder than LiveJournal, and I just miss LiveJournal, okay? <laughs> and I'm on Facebook, and I'm on Instagram as CSE Cooney, um, and... Um, occasionally, if I like you enough and you, you know, we get to be good friends, I'll send you postcards, but not really, like, that's not for everybody. It's just if we become <laughs> friends, okay? Um. <laughs> and uh, you can find me at Jillian with a G, JillianDaniels.com. Uh, I'm also on Twitter as Jill Daniels. I mostly spend my time yelling at politics these days. Mm -hmm. Uh, Relatable. Yes. <laughs> and I'm on the Instagram as Jillian Lynn Daniels, which is mostly photos of my cat and little <laughs> cartoons I do. So that's oh, your cartoons are so good. Yep. Thank you. Uh, they are also on Patreon uh, as Jillian Lynn Daniels, where I post comics and sketches and also poems. And thank you so much for okay. saying that. Um, so if you enjoyed tonight's event, please tell your friends about the series and please come again. Oh.